Good evening. Thank you so much for joining us for our time in the Word of God tonight. Appreciate you being with us on this Father's, uh, uh, Father's Day Sunday evening. Uh, appreciate you joining us, whether you're joining us via the live stream or watching later on on YouTube. It's just a privilege to have you with us uh, as uh, we're going to get right into the Word of God tonight. If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Genesis chapter number 12. Genesis chapter number 12. As we look at this thought, it, would, it will be worth it all. It will be worth it all. Genesis chapter number 12. We'll start reading in verse number 1, read down through about verse number 9, okay? Genesis chapter number 12 and verse number 1. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife, and, and uh, Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan, and into the land of Canaan they came. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sychem, unto the place of Morah, and the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent, having Bethel on the west and high on the east. And there he builded an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. Let's pray. Father, I come to you thanking you so much for the truth of your word, for the example that we have in the life of Abraham. And Father, I pray now that you just use me to share what you've burdened my heart with for this evening. As we look at this very simple thought, it will be worth it all. How we love you. Thank you for all that you do for us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Now, as I was praying about the message for this evening, God brought me to the life of Abraham. And like I said, just this very simple thought, it'll be worth it all. Abraham's life was one of blessings and struggles and riches and sacrifices and rejoicing and sorrow. And the truth is, for any believer, we find ourselves in exactly the same kind of boat. There are good times, and then there are times that we wish that had been much different than they ended up being. But I think as we look at some of the events in the life of Abraham and then put ourselves in his place as he entered glory, we can see that he would, uh, that he would have thought that everything he went through in the end was worth it all. And the same is going to be true for us, I believe. Notice with me, first of all, it was worth the leaving. Now again, look at verses 1 through 4. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation, and I will bless thee and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed. Now, in order to understand how momentous these four verses are, you have to understand a little bit about Ur of the Chaldees, the homeland of Abraham. At the time of Abraham, it had a population of between 250 and 360,000 people. The homes were predominantly two-story townhouse kind of affairs each one having a courtyard in the back. It was a very opulent city with a tremendous library and two large harbors there on the Euphrates that facilitated a booming trade industry. It was also evidently a very wealthy city because intricate jewelry had been found in the excavations there. Abraham also lived in a time politically of great stability as the dynasty that was ruling in that day was a very powerful one. The king at that time was a great administrator. He was a great military man. So it was basically a time of peace. But it was also a city that was steeped in idolatry. The chief idol was Nana, the moon god, and his consort. And the great ziggurat that was there was probably patterned after the Tower of Babel. 
It stood uh, seven stories and marked the phases of the moon in honor of their God. When God appeared to Abraham and called him away from Ur, it wasn't that Abraham was hurting for material wealth or intellectual stimulation or cultural opportunities. He lived in one of the greatest cities of his day. And from a human standpoint, it would have been very easy to think that life was good. And yet, at the call of God, we see Abraham, it says in verse number 4, that Abraham departed. And in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 8, it says, By faith Abraham, when he was called to go out into a place which he should after receive for an inheritance, obeyed. Now you get this next little part. And he went out not knowing whether or whether or where he went. I've often wondered what those days were like telling Sarah that a God that, he had, that they had probably never worshipped had appeared to him and said, leave all of this behind and I'll take you to a better place. I, you know, I think maybe initially Sarah was really excited about going to a much better place. And she goes, where are we going? And Abraham would have had to have looked at her and said, you know, I don't know. He didn't tell me. He said, just leave and he'd show us the way there. And then they'd have to sell their home, many of their possessions leaving a stable life there in the city for a nomadic life with no real idea where or when the final destination was going to be. I don't think there's any doubt as to why Abraham is presented in Scripture as a true man of faith. But many years later, a hundred actually, Abraham truly went home. And even after all the years of struggle and the good times and the bad times and the Battles at home with Sarah and Hagar and Ishmael and Isaac and the test of faith with Lot and the battle with the kings of the east and waiting on the promised son. When Abraham entered paradise, I believe he looked back and acknowledged that it was worth all that he had left behind in order to reach God's best for him. Christian, can I tell you that there's coming a day when you reach heaven, when you reach your true home, that you're going to look back and you're going to say the same thing that Abraham did. It was worth the leaving. The life of sin that we gave up in order to follow Christ is more than worth the blessings that one day we'll receive. Paul said in Philippians chapter number 3 and verse number 8, Yea, doubtless, and I count all things but loss for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ. You have to understand that before his conversion to Christ, Paul was a Pharisee among the Pharisees, well-respected, knowledgeable, and a man of great influence. And yet he left it all. He counted it all as dung. He knew that following Christ was worth the leaving. And like Abraham and like Paul, one day we're going to look back and we too are going to say it truly was worth the day that I gave up everything and accepted Christ as my Savior. Even though there were struggles and even though there were trials and even though sometimes there were heartaches, a lot, there was also blessings and rejoicing. When we experience that day, we'll say that it was definitely worth the leaving. But then secondly, we also see that I think Abraham said it was worth the living. Now go with me back in, in, in chapter number 12, and let's start reading in verse number 6. And Abram passed through the land unto the place of Sychem, unto the place of Morah. And the Canaanite was then in the land. And the Lord appeared unto Abram and said, Unto thy seed will I give this land. And there builded he an altar unto the Lord who appeared unto him. And he removed from thence unto a mountain on the east of Bethel and pitched his tent having Bethel on the west and high on the east. And there he built an altar unto the Lord and called upon the name of the Lord. And Abram journeyed, going on still toward the south. Here we literally see a mountaintop experience in the life of Abraham, according to verse number 8. Many years ago, I was studying, writing literature for a Sunday school class, and, and, and something jumped out at me that's always been a blessing ever since. I knew that Bethel, the term Bethel, actually means the house of God. So out of curiosity, I looked up the word high, or I or Ai, that we talk about in Joshua's day. And I found that the name high, or I, actually means ruin or desolation. And God really showed me something here that blessed my heart. 
God is very clear here in His Word about this event. Abraham's on a mountain with Bethel on the west and high on the east. When west is the direction that Abraham had been moving since he left Ur. He'd been coming from the east to the west. And I believe that this is what God's trying to tell us. Abraham, Abraham looked back in the direction from which he had came, and all he saw was ruin and desolation. But when he looked in the direction that God had brought him, he saw the house of God. He saw the dwelling place of God. And the Bible says that when he saw those things, he built an altar and he called upon the name of the Lord. I believe that what we have pictured here is the moment of decision and the moment of commitment in our lives. Abraham looked back and, and really saw what he had left behind. It looked good on the outside, but in the end it was just ruin and desolation. And he realized that he didn't want to live there anymore. Instead, he looked where God was and he committed himself to following him. Abraham committed himself to living according to God's direction and according to God's will. And even though there were days in Abraham's life when the spirit was willing but the flesh was weak, I believe that when he entered into the courts of paradise that Abraham said, it's not only worth what I left, but it was worth the life that I lived. Abraham's life at that time wasn't always one of these. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11 and verse number 9, By faith he sojourned in the land of promise as in a strange country, dwelling in tabernacles with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. He dwelt in a tabernacle. He dealt, dwelt in a tent, never seeing in this life the end result of what God had promised him. And as Christians, I know sometimes we wonder, why am I trying to live the way that God says? Nobody else seems to notice and nobody seems to care. And it doesn't seem like it's making a difference to anybody else. Why am I trying so hard when it looks like it's not making a difference? It just doesn't seem worth it. But can I tell you to take heart? There's coming a day when you'll realize it truly was worth the commitment that you made. But the key is that you have to make that commitment to follow Him. To look at the pleasures of this life as of no value if they get in the way of you following God. Because while all Christians will be happy to find themselves in heaven. Some, the Bible says, will be rejoicing more than others. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, starting in verse 11, For other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now if any man build upon this foundation gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire, and the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss, but he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. Do you see it there? If we follow him, and we're willing to do so completely, if we choose to live for him with all that we are, and in all that we do, then one day... We're going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ and we're going to realize that it was worth the life that we've lived for Christ. Abraham realized that. Paul realized that. And we need to realize it too. But then thirdly, I also believe that Abraham saw it was worth the loveliness. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 11, and verse number 10, for he, talking about Abraham, for he looked for a city which hath foundations, whose builder and maker is God. For years growing up, I'd always heard that verse quoted as, for he looked for a city whose builder and maker was God, or is God. But as I think about Abraham, I think God was pointing out something here very important with that phrase, which hath foundations. Remember that Abraham had left a very stable and a very prosperous city, probably lived in one of the nicer uh, townhouses there in the city. He had a home, a place that was his that he returned to in the evening, a very stable kind of life. 
But for a hundred years, Abraham lived in a tent with an earthen floor. He had to move regularly to provide for his herds and his flocks. For a hundred years, he was a pilgrim and a stranger, always on the move. Somehow I believe that when Abraham entered paradise, one of the loveliest parts was the fact that he didn't have to move anymore. He finally had reached his home, a city which had foundations. And to Abraham, I believe that there was not a more lovely thought than I don't have to move anymore. As believers, one day there's going to be a day like we've never imagined whether by death or by the rapture, we're going to hear Christ come up hither into a place that He's prepared for us. And we will never have to move again. And that brings us to the last thing that I believe that Abraham saw, and that was it was worth the Lord. That Abraham and our Lord had an intimate relationship is without question. The Bible even tells us in Isaiah chapter 41 and verse number 8, but thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. What an amazingly close and special relationship they must have had. I was thinking about that on the other day, and God reminded me of the words of Christ to a hypocritical group of Pharisees in, in John chapter number 8 and verse 56. Christ said, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it, and was glad. Of course, we know the Pharisees mocked him when he said that. They said, you're not even 50 years old. How did Abraham see your day? Warren Wearsby kind of summarizes it really well when he says this. How did Abraham see our Lord's day? That is, his life and ministry on earth. The same way he saw the future city that, won without, or that had foundations, by faith. God did not give Abraham some special vision of our Lord's life and ministry but he did give him the spiritual perception to see these future events. Certainly Abraham saw the birth of the Messiah and the miraculous birth of his own son Isaac. He certainly saw Calvary when he offered Isaac to God. Abraham could see the heavenly priesthood of the Lord in the marriage of Isaac. And Abraham could see a picture of the, or in the priestly ministry of Melchizedek. Abraham could see the heavenly priesthood of the Lord. And in the marriage of Isaac, Abraham could see a picture of the marriage of the Lamb. And then the day came when Abraham was carried into paradise. And I believe he once again saw the one who spoke to him as a friend on the hills overlooking Sodom and Gomorrah. And, it surra and surrounded by all the loveliness all of the things that he was seeing around him, he knew it was worth it because now he was with the Lord. The things that he had left, the life of struggles and the blessings that he had lived, the loveliness of all of his surroundings paled in comparison to the fact that he was with the Lord. Paul said again, Philippians chapter number 3, starting in verse 7, but what things were gained to me, those I counted lost for Christ, yea, doubtless, and I count all things but lost for the excellency of the knowledge of Christ Jesus my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and do count them but dung, that I may win Christ, and be found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith, that I may know him, and the power of his resurrection, and the fellowship of his sufferings being made conformable unto his death. Can you imagine, like Abraham, being called the friend of God? Well, can I tell you something? The Bible says you can be. Christ said in John chapter 15, starting in verse 14, Ye are my friends if you do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Like Abraham, to earn the title of friend, we have to live by faith and do His blessed will. And even though it might not always be an easy journey, when we step into heaven's portals, we'll be able to say like Abraham, and we'll be able to say like Paul, surely, 
it was worth the Lord. Father, how I thank you for the truth of your word, just this little snippet of a picture in the life of Abraham. Father, how I thank you that the truth from Genesis to Revelation is that if we live by faith and follow you, there's going to come a day where we're going to see it was worth it all. Father, how I thank you that it's, been, it was, it's going to be worth the leaving and the living and the loveliness, Father. But most of all, how I thank you that it's going to be worth the Lord. We give you the praise and the glory for it all. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Well, God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us again this evening. Pray that the message was a blessing and an encouragement to your heart. And I, and I can assure you without any doubt, if you'll follow the Lord, it'll be worth it all. God bless. Hope to see you soon.